Good morning, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar that is dedicated to the European supply chain legislation and the upcoming German supply chain law. This is a topic that is even more important today given the pandemic situation of today. And I hope yeah, that you are all safe and healthy. One question before I continue, can you all hear me well? Could you send just a chat in the question, bo in the question box, please? Thank you, thanks so much. Okay, let me see. Yes, it seems that it works well. That's wonderful, thanks a lot. Okay, it's my pleasure to spend the next hour together with you. My name is Karen Ekberg and I'm the CEO of our Leadership and Sustainability. I have a long experience in the sustainability area and among others, I have worked at Adidas where I was responsible for environment globally. And before that, I was, I was responsible for sustainability globally at ASA Bloy, a Swedish multinational corporation. Leadership and Sustainability was founded by myself in 2015. And we have the privilege to work with many of you who are on this webinar today. So thanks so much for joining us. We will now have a brief look at how to use the GoToWebinar features. You are all on mute today in order to ensure the best audio quality. We have a very large audience today, but we will have time uh, to take your questions towards the end of the webinar. So please feel free to send us your questions during the presentation via the question function. And in a follow-up email, we will provide you with a link to recording of this webinar and a link to download the web presentation as well. So rest assured, uh, everything will be covered and you will receive everything after the webinar. So here is an overview of what we will do today. We will start with a short examination of different stakeholder risks and perspectives. And then we will continue with the supply chain legislation at the European level. Before we are heading to the details of the upcoming supply chain law in Germany and its compliance, compliance measures. And before the webinar will come to an end, we have some useful information for you regarding the method that we are using to conduct risk assessments. And we will give some information about leadership and sustainability, and then we will take your questions before we close the webinar. And let's begin with looking at some stakeholder risks and perspectives. And I am aware that many of you, probably all of you already know about those risks. So let's have a look here. It started with a Xinjiang cotton ban by brands and it has turned to a boycott by China. So China is now boycotting Western clothing brands over Xinjiang cotton, H&M, Sara, Nike, Burberry, and also targeting BCI, the Better Cotton Initiative itself. We all remember, of course, also the Rana Plaza um, collapse, the building collapse in Bangladesh um, several years ago. But of course, it's one of the largest or the largest um, collapse that we have seen in, in the sector. And other examples are the claims about unsustainable labor practices. And in this case, they were uh, made towards Samsung and Panasonic. This particular case was about exploited migrant workers in Malaysia. And these scandals trigger actions among the brands and often also collaborative projects within the respective sector. So what is the consumer perspective? The studies shown here are not specifically about the supply chain, but there are general studies about the perspective on consumers on sustainability. And we have 42% of global consumers, they want more new products that are socially responsible and environmentally friendly. And would also like to see products with sustainability benefits increase sales by 4%. And that's also actually a fact that uh, you can increase sales uh, with sustainability benefits. And the number of consumers who are willing to pay more for brands that are committed to sustainability continues to rise. And in 2015, they were 66%. Of course, we always take into, need to take into consideration that there is one thing um, 
to compare or to say what, what I am going to do. And the other thing is, what am I doing when I actually have the choice and am buy, and am buying the, um, uh, the product? And uh, that those studies are not so, uh, they are not so common, unfortunately. So very often we have to rely on studies that um, are um, from consumers saying what they would do. And then uh, finally, 78.5% of millennials consider a company's social and environmental commitments before choosing a job. And for those of you who are managing sustainability at a corporation, this is perhaps also an aspect that is really interesting for you to consider uh, because uh, this may be one incentive also for your HR department to be involved in your sustainability programs since we know that this is really a, a very strong um, a very strong criteria for many millennials when they are looking for a new job. Then what is the NGO perspective? Well, we have chosen a perhaps not so well-known um, NGO in this case here, uh, Mr. Herman, Deputy Global Nature Fund Managing Director and Head of Business and Biodiversity. He says, that many companies are already showing how it's done and are setting a good example for social and ecological responsibility. But not everyone, and people, nature and biodiversity suffer from our unscrupulous trade and consumption. That is why it is important to create binding regulations committed to fair trade as expressed in a supply chain law. And let's begin our view of the supply chain laws in the European Union. What are the rights and obligations regarding supply chain management at European level? Well, uh, we will speak a lot about the due diligence. So I will actually start here and let us begin with the definition. Due diligence is the process enterprises should carry out to identify, prevent, mitigate, and account for how they address actual and potential adverse impacts in their own operations, their supply chain and other business relationships, as recommended in the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. And effective due diligence should be supported by efforts to embed RBC or responsible business conduct into policies and management systems and aims to enable enterprises to remediate adverse impacts that they cause or to which they contribute. And the source here is, uh, of course, one of the documents that we will be talking about as well, the OECD due diligence guidelines for multinational enterprises. And so the existing frameworks uh, so far uh, are the UN guiding principle on business and human rights and the OECD due diligence guidelines for multinational enterprises. And this document is actually also available by sector. Uh, so, for example, for the footwear and apparel sector, there is also one uh, specific due diligence guidelines available. Uh, but uh, what we have also seen is that this, which is a voluntary approach, it does not sufficiently address the negative impacts of globalized business activities. And we also know, for example, there are so many companies who are doing a lot already, and there are many companies who would like to do more, but there is always this question and this adverse impact from, from competition. So if I do a lot, do my competitors also do a lot? And are we then, uh, are we really playing on a level playing field? And that is, of course, also a very important, um, uh, important rule uh, to follow. And so now we have come to the European level here, and there is a law in, uh, in the pipeline. And uh, the preparations for a European supply chain law, it is moving forward. The European Parliament adopted an initiative on 10th of March this year with 504 votes in favor, 79 against, and 112 who didn't, uh, who didn't uh, vote. So you see it's a very strong uh, vote in favor. And there will be a proposal uh, in the second quarter of 2021. And uh, what is the content of the law? Well, 
the binding EU diligence, uh, due diligence rules would oblige companies to monitor, identify, prevent and remedy aspects of the value chain that could or do infringe on human rights, the environment, but also on good uh, governance. So with human rights, includes it includes social, trade union and labor rights, the um, environment, which would include uh, contributing to climate change and then good governance. And the objectives of the law are bringing about change beyond European Union borders and all companies that want to access the EU internal market, including those established outside the European Union, would have to prove that they comply with environmental and human rights due diligence obligations. So everything that is sold in the, within the European uh, Union borders would need to uh, prove that the company behind it has, has a strong due diligence process in place. So not only the European companies, but also the companies from outside the European Union who are selling into the European Union. And we see here also uh, the national authorities would check if companies enforce the rules. And uh, the proposal would also give victims of human rights violations the right to take European Union companies to court. So uh, quite a strong legislation here. And so an expert uh, perspective here, Lara Wolters, a member of the group of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats in the European Parliament, she has issued a statement on the planned European supply chain legislation. And she said, a new law on corporate due diligence will set the standard for responsible business conduct in Europe and beyond. And no longer will companies be able to harm people and the planet without being held accountable. So this was the European Union um, uh, level. And let's now also take a look at the German uh, legislation. So uh, what has happened so far, let's make a brief recap of the global and German movement towards the supply chain law. So the discussion itself is not new, as we have seen also in the previous section. At the United Nations level, discussions on regulations of transnational businesses and their global supply chains started already in the 1970s. In 2011, the Human Rights Council endorsed the guiding principles on business and human rights. Human Global Compact, and in 2016, Germany adopted its National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights. But the underlying problem is that both the UNGPs and Germany's NAP, they are entirely voluntary in nature. And there have been studies made about the actually the um, implementation of these voluntary standards within the industry. And fact is that within the European Union, only 30% of the companies, they actually consider those recommendations. And in German, it's even a lower value, only 22%. So, and there are also no consequences for abuses. So the, the exploitation of the environment in developing countries is in effect widely accepted. And in reality, child labor and other human rights um, um, uh, abuses, they are tolerated, even if it's indirectly, but they are tolerated on a massive scale. And therefore, finally, a new law regarding the supply chain was inevitable. So all the stakeholders agreed that a strong supply chain law needs to be developed. And therefore, a draft law has been developed and has also been published on the 28th of February, so very recently. And on 3rd of March, the government bill was adopted. The expected entry into force is on 1st of January 2023, so in one and a half year. And from that day on, it's not only uh, entering into force, but is also to be applied already. So the, to summarize, we have the law entering into force on the 1st of January. It is not a voluntary approach, 
there is a clear, proportionate and reasonable legal framework for due diligence along the supply chain. And we'll speak more about the specifics uh, very soon. It requires companies with head office in Germany to verify all direct su suppliers for compliance with social and environmental standards. And the requirements for companies are internationally compatible and are based on the due diligence standard of the UN guiding uh, principles. Breaches of the due diligence, are, they are sanctionable for also for the first time. And a central point of the draft law is remedial uh, measures. It is explicitly mentioned also that the termination of business relations is only considered an ultima ratio. So that is not the first thing to do uh, to terminate business relationships. Um, and uh, what are the risk areas now? Let's have a look here. So the ones that are covered are human rights and social standards. And you see here, for example, prohibition of child labor, elimination of all forms of forced labor. We see this cover uh, the ILO um, core conventions. And on the environmental side, we have soil, water, and air protection, um, consideration of the Minamata Convention for the use of mercury, consideration of the Stockholm Convention when using chemicals. And finally, we also have, under other aspects, use of security forces for the protection of entrepreneurial projects. And uh, who is, is affected now? Well, the companies that employ at least 3,000 employees are affected already immediately from the 1st of January 2023. And this will uh, cover more than 600 companies. Only one year later, companies that employ at least 1,000 employees are affected and need to follow this law. So more than 2,900 companies is what is expected to be um, uh, to be uh, forced to follow this law from then on, from 1st of January 2024. And now let's have a look at the specific compliance requirements of the German law. So uh, again, we have companies with more than 3,000 or 1,000 staff uh, from 2023 or 2024 respectively. And the first part is the due diligence, which goes along with the introduction of a systematic risk management. The second part requires documentation and reporting, which means that companies have to publish a report on prevention measures regularly. And if these requirements are not met, there will be sanctions. And this could be, for example, fines and exclusion from public tenders for up to three years. And now let's look at each of these three elements one by one. Companies must establish and effectively implement appropriate risk management. This includes all relevant business processes, risk identification, prevention to stop breaches and minimize breaches, a designation of a responsible person, and also to inform management at least once a year. And regarding the documentation and reporting obligations, companies are obliged to report annually on the fulfillment of their due diligence obligations, whether and which risks that have been identified and what measures that have been taken. And then how the impact and effectiveness of the measures are assessed and the results of the assessment. What consequences are drawn for the future and if no risk has been identified, and this is adequately explained in the report, no further explanations are required. And the report must be published on the internet no later than four months after the annual closing. And the report must be accessible free of charge for at least seven years. So those are the requirements regarding the documentation and sanctions. Uh, the Federal Office of Economics and Export Control, they, of course, they support companies, they uh, support also with the implementation, they monitor um, the implementation, and uh, if the law is violated by a company, they may be excluded from public tenders for three years. 
There may be penalty payments of up to 50,000 euro, and there may also be other fines for administrative offenses. So now, how can you prepare uh, for this supply chain law and laws, uh, since also we have the law in the European Union coming up soon? Well, we have a few step-by-step -step, uh, guidance that we have prepared. You need to identify your risk. You need to analyze your risk. You need to have appropriate and effective measures. You need to also establish a complaints mechanism and you need to have the transparent and public reporting in place. And of course, we recommend that you start in time to develop uh, your system because this is really a management system that you need to, that you need to develop. And we have, um, one method that we apply for materiality assessments um, and uh, this the materiality assessments they uh, we conduct them in order to identify impacts risks and opportunity and i would like to show you very briefly about this method and what we do is we first define the value chain so your entire business operations including of course your supply chain we define all the sustainability impact categories that we want to cover in the materiality assessment. And we have seen several of them already, uh, the human rights uh, categories, the environmental categories, the governance categories. And then we estimate the risks and prioritize them depending on likelihood and severity. We look at also status, impacts, risks and opportunities actually as well, because of course you don't have only risks, you may also have great opportunities, um, especially on the environmental side, but also on the social side. Um, it's possible to have uh, lo actually lots of opportunities and of course you should always work on them as well. And then for risks, we have different categories that we have defined and the same for opportunities. So there are several subcategories for both risks and for opportunities. And then what we do is we use a qualitative quantitative approach to uh, evaluate all these different um, categories along the value chain. And we have a system where we um, evaluate with us on a scale one, two, three where uh, one is either something is fully implemented, like for example, a management system is fully implemented and effective, uh, or for example, the impact or the risk or the opportunity is very small, then you get a one. On the other hand, if nothing has been implemented, or if there is a significant impact, a significant risk or a great opportunity, then uh, you get a three in that particular segment. And uh, how we want this method to um, uh, to work is that with the threes, it should always lead to an action. The threes always tell you that here is something I need to act on. I have, I don't have something implemented. I actually need to have that ma management system. I need to have that grievance system in place or I have a significant risk and therefore I need to manage that risk, or I have a significant opportunity. And of course, I also want to seize that opportunity then. And we work in a very detailed manner in an Excel table. And uh, then uh, we summarize the results into what we call a hotspot assessment. And you can see here now one example. This is an invented example, uh, but this is how we work. You can see the value chain here. And obviously the value chain is much longer than this, but uh, this is just an example. So it continues here. In this case, we have chosen management and strategy processes. So the overall management of the corporation, we have chosen design and we have chosen procurement. And then you would have supply chain tier one, supply chain tier two, supply chain tier three, uh, et cetera, retail perhaps, uh, et, uh, and so on. And you can see here also some examples of, um, and th in this case, we have added only environmental uh, topics, and but of course, you can do the same with the social um, categories as well. And in this case, we have taken water quality, greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity, and you see there are a few more as well. And then what happens here once we have done the detailed um, assessment is that you get 
these colors, this hotspot uh, coloring. So, which means that whenever you have a very dark orange color, you have significant impacts and risks. So, in this case, for example, greenhouse gas emissions would be in the design process. Of course, not in the action of doing design, but a design, as we know, have quite a significant impact on all other business um, areas and uh, the supply chain as well. So then with a dark orange color, you would have significant impacts and risks. With a medium, uh, with a with a lighter orange, you would have medium impacts and risks. And on the opportunity side, dark green means significant opportunities and lighter green means medium opportunities. And if it's white, you have a smaller impact risk or opportunity. And sometimes we gray out, sometimes some um, uh, some cells are not relevant or are not assessed uh, because perhaps they are overlapping and they, it doesn't make sense to, to um, evaluate um, a score for a particular cell. And here then now you can see, you get a big picture of where your risks and your opportunities are. So go after the dark orange and go after the dark green first. And you probably need to manage the lighter orange and the lighter green as well. But obviously you should prioritize the darker colors. So this is what it can look like um, after conducting such a materiality assessment. And we would, of course, like to help you and we can help you to manage your entire supply chain aligned with the SAC tools, like with the HIGI BRM, the brand and retail module, with the facility environmental module, uh, with the facility social and labor module, or which is also called the social and labor convergence program, the BPI, CETIHC, Cradle to Cradle, or other programs, and uh, to conduct the materiality assessments, to support you also with strategy development, handbooks and guidelines, and goals and action plans, as well as webinars. Of, as you know, we do a lot of webinars and face-to-face -face trainings as well. And I would also like to welcome you. We have another webinar series beginning already next week. And this is about the Sustainable Apparel Coalition and the HIG BRM, the brand and retail module. And we have picked out a few sections of the brand and retail module. It's a very comprehensive module with a lot of questions. And it's a self-assessment module, which can also be verified. Um, and uh, as I said, there are lots of sections. We have picked a few of them and we from there, we will also be picking a few questions and we will dive in deeper and discuss uh, those questions specifically. And you can see here the dates, etc. And you, of course, welcome to, uh, welcome to uh, register for those. And uh, then just uh, two slides about our company. We promote sustainability as corporate strategy, as business model and as leadership quality. And that is also, of course, from where our name comes, leadership and sustainability, because we think we all need to take leadership and uh, take the lead in the area of sustainability. We need this combination. And we are actually globally now, uh, globally active now. Our head office is in Germany. Uh, we are a member of Sustainable Apparel Coalition. We are ZTHC training providers, BPI consultants, and we will also very soon become cradle to cradle assessors. And um, here you can see an overview of our services. And here you can also see some of our team. Today, we are a team of around 25 persons globally. And now, finally, we have time for your questions. Are there any questions uh, from the audience? Let's have a look here. Yes, we have one question here. How will companies have to show the European Union entities that uh, their supply chain is social and environmentally responsible. Well, uh, they will need to adopt this due diligence uh, process and accordingly the different um, specific processes and methods. So they will need to develop um, a risk assessment, 
conduct a risk assessment, and then, of course, depending on the risks, also respond to them. So if you uh, see that you have a significant risk of um, forced labor in a certain country or with certain suppliers, then you actually need to show that you manage those risks and uh, reduce them. And it also will include that you conduct audits uh, with your suppliers um, so that you can show that uh, their, uh, that their uh, performance is okay and that they are also legally compliant and compliant with your process. Okay. So these companies will have to disclose publicly their supply chains on their website. Um, this is a good question and I cannot tell you um, if that will actually be required or if it's enough to show that that assessment, risk assessment has been done and that you are managing your supply chain accordingly. Of course, there are many sectors and actually many brands today and companies today who already report about their supply chains and are very transparent even about their, not only about tier one suppliers, but also about tier two suppliers. But I cannot tell you if this will be a formal requirement right now. We will see when, uh, when, the, uh, when the next versions are ready. Okay. <laughs> All right, <laughs> someone who likes the, uh, the alignment. <laughs> Do you believe actual site audits are clearly required by the German law? Uh, I do believe uh, it is, yes. And are the words social audit used in the draft law versus quality auditors looking in a very light way at some social but not robustly? Well, um, I don't know if the terminology of social audit, but I can look it up and uh, and give you a response to that. And I will anyway, any questions that I may not uh, be able to respond to here now live, we will uh, pull those questions together into an Excel table and, may, and write the responses, of course, and make it available to all of you together with, a, uh, with a, uh, the sending out the, uh, the recording afterwards. But yes, it is not a, a very light approach with quality auditors that have a few questions about, uh, about the social um, area. So the maximum penalty if a company doesn't adhere to the new German supply chain law is 50,000 euros. Yes, according to the present, uh, to the present wording it is, that's correct. Is there any criteria set for selecting the due diligence assessors? No, there is not. What are your views on the French duty of vigilance law? Has it lived up to expectations? Well, um, just also for uh, all of your information, the French duty of vigilance law is actually also a national law similar to uh, the German law that is uh, coming up now. And um, according to studies that have been made, also the French duty of vigilance law has not uh, succeeded in uh, lived up, living up to its expectations. So it's a very similar um, view there. Um, like the numbers I showed about 30% in the European Union who are not voluntarily um, living up to the principles and guidelines that are already available and the same situation we have with the French uh, duty of vigilance law. So that is of course also uh, sometimes the the challenge that um, yeah that the the enforcement may not be strong enough or uh, uh, yes or not timely enough. Should companies establish their own complaints mechanism or should they join an industry-wide one? Not a simple question to respond, my friend, to. <laughs> but um, uh, I think you need your own as well. 
you may join uh, some of the schemes that are available but of course it is important that it's possible also to specifically uh, send a compl complaint directly to you and your or to your company so that you can address it if it uh, if it applies to your company yeah is there encouragement in the German law that companies participate in collaboration initiatives? There is a, a general encouragement, but there is nothing specifically uh, mentioned about that. But obviously, this is something that is very much encouraged um, uh, to do in the OECD guidelines, for example, and the due diligence guidelines as well, that companies participate in collaboration initiatives. And I think that we have seen over the past 10, 15 years that there are many collaborative initiatives that are actually are very powerful. And even in some or in some or in many cases, um, companies may be too small, may not have enough power. And therefore, of course, also those collaboration initiatives are very important. It's a very important vehicle um, in the uh, in the sphere of different uh, projects and programs that you can implement. Will reporting according to GRI be sufficient for the U European Union Due Diligence Act? Will there be a formal requirement for audits? No, uh, as far as I know about a GRI today, uh, there are of course requirements to conduct a risk assessment and report about that but the, in the GRI, but it is not specific and detailed in the way that um, those two pieces of legislation that are coming up uh, right now are. And will there be a formal requirement for audits? Um, no, it's not specified really. Who knows, it may be an ordinance that comes as a follow-up then uh, that might specify that, but uh, I'm not aware of that right now. I can check uh, also regarding this question. Will the use of external standard supplier assessments um, be sufficient? Yes, if there are, uh, if the, these are protocols that are built on 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 standards um, like uh, SA8000, for example, or the Ecotex. Uh, step standard or the um, the SAC tools or other tools. There are so many different um, standards to audit for, for both social and environmental. And uh, I expect that those um, standardized assessments that they will be uh, accepted and be sufficient. <laughs> Is the law going to be enrolled for smaller companies than 1,000 members or 1,000 employees in the future, in your opinion? Yes, perhaps later. <laughs> it's difficult to say. I think that uh, there are, of course, uh, yes, reasons to believe that that may be the case, yeah. How will transparency and traceability be verified? There are no specific uh, uh, information um, or details about this uh, yet. If companies are supposed to ensure suppliers are compliant, but also not cut them if they are not, then does the law allow for improvement periods of time? Yes, it does. So uh, if there is a non-compliance and you cannot or, or don't want to cut the ties. And actually, as I mentioned already, the law actually specifically mentions that this should not be the first step. Then you need to have a very clear improvement plan. You should, of course, also have an escalation uh, plan um, in place so that you know that if there is no improvement, then there will be a warning and um, and uh, if there is still no improvement and then at some point in time you may need to cut the ties but of course this should be the only be the last um, uh, straw so to say do you know how is currently the situation in spain no i'm sorry i do not okay Yes, I think those were the questions. There are, were a few questions where I would like to follow up on afterwards. Anyone who has another question? We still have a few minutes left for that. 
you're welcome. Any other question? No? Okay. Then I also want to show you, you will receive with the presentation the list of all references so you can go and have a look for yourself and read about all the details. And uh, with that, I would like to close. I would like to thank you so much for joining this webinar. Um, we have a very brief survey that shows immediately when you leave this webinar. And I would really ask you to complete that survey. That is really helpful for us to give us your feedback. And uh, finally, I hope that you take care of yourselves, take care of your family, stay safe and healthy. And I hope that we will meet soon again. All right. Bye-bye.